you guys, you're not going to hear a great deal from me today. I'm going to be bringing on four of our, or three of our, um, awesome clients from the degreed portfolio. And they're going to talk to you a little bit about their stories and about how they are really making the most of their technology investments. So we're going to do exactly what it says on the title, fingers crossed. We're going to keep it super informal, so we're going to come out, we're going to sit down. And I'm only telling you that because I'm British and we have to be super polite. But there's not a lot of room here and I don't want anyone to fall off. Um, so we're going to talk about making the most of technology investments. We're going to hear from three of our clients, like I said. Once these guys have talked to you about their stories, we're going to have an activity, which I'm told you guys are going to really get involved with. I heard you're a great group, so those guys are going to set that exercise up for you in a second. And then we're going to have a Q&A session before we close out for coffee. So please get your best questions ready, because we really want to hear from you um, in terms of just you know, digging deeper into what these guys have got to say today. <coughs> Excuse me. So it would be great if you could give a rousing round of applause to our panel today, who are... Darcy from Providence St. Joseph Healthcare, <laughs> who's promised me she's going to be super Southern American in her introduction, <laughs> so we can all look forward to that. Um, also, we have Peter, who's joining us from Ericsson. <laughs> and then we have a um, dynamic duo, I'm going to call them. I don't know how dynamic you'll find them. I think they're pretty dynamic. Of Kylie and uh, Rich, who are joining us from Booking.com. So I'm going to try and use this borderline temperamental clicker, so bear with me if it goes wrong. Oh, <laughs> you'll see from my surprise. And you see all these guys here, but you see their beautiful pictures too, and you'll see the roles that they have. So you'll see they're joining us from senior roles across these big organisations that are going to talk to you about their degree journey and beyond today. So I'm going to hand straight away to Darcy, um, who's going to talk to you about the Providence St. Joseph healthcare uh, journey, and then we'll have a couple of questions for Darcy. So over to you, Darcy. Thank you. So we are the one organization that is not global. So I'm representing the good old US of A here um, today. You promised a yawl. You haven't given us a yawl. Oh, I know. I said I, maybe I should use my southern accent because I'm the only one that does yeah. have, well, I have the accent um, up here. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Providence St. Joseph Health. Um, with Degreed, healthcare has been lagging, as many of you, if you're not in the healthcare business, um, it's lagging in learning and development. Um, we're very traditional brick and mortar. And so for us to take on a challenge of really driving uh, a new experience for our employees, which we call caregivers, so you'll hear me say caregivers, all of our employees are named that, uh, has been quite substantial. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what we did and why we did it. Uh, to give you a brief overview, um, we are a faith-based nonprofit healthcare system. We are the third largest in the United States. We have 117,000 caregivers um, in seven states. And our mission, as you can see, um, is that it's an expression of God's healing love witnessed through the ministry of Jesus. When we are steadfast in serving all, especially those who are the poor and vulnerable. Um, which I know a lot of you who are in secular or non-faith-based, some of us go and have this visceral reaction to God and Jesus. Um, so it's not to say that we're all walking around the halls talking about God and Jesus, but it is part of our heritage. Um, so we were founded 159 years ago by uh, the Sisters of Providence, and it was uh, a small pack of women who um, came over from Montreal, Canada, and set up shop with 10 cents in their pocket and ended up creating this huge health system, which we then integrated uh, a couple of years ago now with St. Joseph, who are the Sisters of Orange, who came over from La Puy, France, and did the same thing um, in Southern California. So some tough ladies um, that we, we get to work and grow um, their vision. So um, one of the areas that we're focused on, we talked about implementing degree, is our promise. This promise is to our caregivers is to know me, care for me, ease my way. And we realized very quickly a few years ago that when it came to learning and development, we did not know them, we did not ease their way, we did not care for them. And so we wanted to make that change. And that's really what we're trying to do is hang our hats on living into our promise. So from here, this is our strategy. So as many of you, this may not be new, especially in North America, um, but we, like many other healthcare organizations, are having to change and pivot. Uh, we have other external non-healthcare organizations who are pushing us to change quite rapidly. Uh, we have folks like Amazon and Warren Buffett 
and Chase and other um, organizations that think they can do healthcare better. And at Providence St. Joseph, we wanna be the leaders in that space. So we knew we had to change. And so what we've done is looked at moving from a very impatient, go to the hospital if you're sick model, to outpatient. So things like express care, urgent care, telehealth, where you can actually, the other day my husband wasn't feeling well and he Skyped with his doctor. And his doctor was able to prescribe um, medication and we went straight away to um, our local Walgreens to get the, the pharmacy um, prescription filled. It's that access that's getting pushed on all over the place. And we've got to come up with the times, which then lends us into what are the skills for the future of healthcare? What do healthcare providers look like in the future? Because we will be automating. Um, we know that automation computers are safer in some cases than human decision making. So we're gonna have a lot of changes in our industry that we're gonna need to keep up with. Our strategy, like I said, was to lend to our promise so in learning and development, we're looking at how do we create a more personalized experience, so knowing them, knowing what they're doing, how they're doing, and what they need and when they need it, and developing personalized learning journeys that will help with that. Caring for them is creating learner-centric high value. Uh, no more of the meat and potatoes e-learning. We've got to get away from that. People aren't learning, they're checking a box. So we really want to address that part of it when we care for our caregivers, making it relevant and valuable. And then easy. Um, we are not mobile yet. We'll be moving into the world of mobility um, this year. And so this is one area that allows us to uh, move into the mobile space, which we know all of our caregivers are using their phones um, and mobile devices. And how do we then bring the learning closer to them? So from here, I'm gonna hand, do you want me to hand it over? Just yeah, I'm just gonna to ask go you back. a couple of questions. Oh, if that's lovely. Okay. <laughs> lovely. So I think we should give Darcy a round of applause, first of all. <laughs> and thank you for sharing that with us, because it, it's really an inspiring story to hear, you know, right from the, the kind of foundations of your organization, and to have a mission and a vision like that must be really empowering. Um, but I, I guess, you know, you talk about your organization, it's clearly a big organization, and you mm -hmm. have, a number of, I guess, field workers or hourly workers, and I just wonder how you kind of make sure that all of those guys are included in what you're doing with, with your learning landscape and, and what you do for, for that kind of level of engagement. Yeah, so we are challenged. We do have hourly workers. Um, all of our workers um, are um, typically those that are what I would call revenue producing, even though we're a nonprofit, are those that are bedside and those at our bedside don't have access. And so that was a challenge for us, is to figure out how do we bring learning closer to them in more of a performance support model. Uh, we also have unions, and when you look at learning, um, learning oftentimes in our space is looked at non-productivity or non-productive hours, and our leaders get ranked on non-productive hours. And so when they ask for more employees or staff, depending upon that, if the bucket is learning, their folks are learning, it can be counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve. So there's things that we're having to work out in the system as mm -hmm. well as not just enabling technologies. But what we found is that if we can, for hourly workers as well as our full-time staff and our union workers, is designed in a way that's short, quick, which all of you guys are hearing that same theme. I don't think that's an aha moment for anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, but how do we do that in a way that's super relevant to the work that they're doing just in time on the floor? And, and so it's been a challenge, but we're working through it. I've got three people from my team, David and Andrea and Frank here that um, I wish I could take the, I get to stand up here and say how awesome we are, but they're the ones behind the scenes making it happen. Should we, should, should we give them an, an applause? I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> You can see there's going to be a lot of clapping, just bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, thanks. Take it away. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Um, now, I guess one of the things that all of us have got in common in this room, whether you're working with an organization or in an organization on learning and development, is that you want to make learning a habit in your organization. Is that true for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and to be honest, that to some extent is our kicking point off in, in Ericsson, uh, because if you're going to make learning a habit, then in times where it's becoming tougher and tougher on people's time, to free up time, then you've got to make learning easy. 
it's got to be easy to access and it's got to be easy, easy to consume and, and it's got to be enjoyable to consume as well. So that to some extent is where we started out with Degreed and where we start out with our technology investments as well. But I'm conscious as well that some of you, if not a lot of you in the room will be thinking, what does that Ericsson company do? Mm -hmm. um, didn't they have phones a while ago? <laughs> didn't they go in partnership with Sony? Um, so if you're thinking that, then we are no longer in partnership with Sony, but we have been around since 1876, and that's because most of what we do is around networks. We create the mobile networks um, that enable yours, my phone, to work. Um, we do the services for it, we do the support for it, uh, we do the software around it. So our customers are the likes of Sprint, Telia, Vodafone, those sorts of people. Um, so that's, that's what we do. Um, and uh, we are in 180 countries, as it says on the slide. Um, we've got around 95,000 permanent employees. Add the contractors in, then you get a lot more. Um, so we, we also have a challenge when we're introducing technologies of introducing it across lots of different countries. Um, but if one of the words I want you to take away is learning made easy, which is, which is what we're trying to achieve, another one is around alignment. And to, to a great extent, to be successful with our technology, then what we had to ensure was we had alignment when we introduce something new. Uh, and, and for example, with Learning Made Easy, that we actually have a company brand now called Quest for Easy. So what we were trying to do there was to really map what we're trying to do in learning through to what we're trying to do as a company. And, uh, and that kind of alignment, I think, to get the most out of your technology is really important. Yeah. And what you see up here is what we call our people story. So this is, if you like, our commitment, our deal with our employees to say, if you know, what we want to give you is around these different aspects of learning. And it, you know, it's making the point that learning is continuous. So what we do in our technologies and when we introduce them is to enable us to get that one step further all the time around having continuous learning. But not only did we want to align with our overall company branding, we want to align, of course, with our people story. So when people think about in our organization and see the, the new technologies we're introducing, they think, yeah, I really get this. Um, because what we're trying to do is these three elements. So one, we're starting off around that learning. We make it easier for you. So these, if you like, are our three commitments. So technology, does, of course, does not exist for its own sake. It exists for, to enable the experience that employees get to be better. So we want to make it easier. We want it to matter. And, and by making it matter, it helps build that elusive learning culture. And I don't know about you, but when I've been in learning a fair amount of time, and I sometimes get a bit frustrated when people talk about we're trying to create the learning culture. Because that, that, because what do you mean by that? What do you actually want to see? Which is, firstly, you wanted to make it matter, and secondly, you want that habit that it comes into everybody's daily, weekly work. Um, so that's what we really mind, mean by we make it matter, but we also make it drive our business. We make it relevant to our business. So in this last piece, if you like, the one place on this to focus on is the middle column, which is about the experience, because that's what we're trying to achieve. We, we're trying to build an ecosystem architecture that has degreed at its heart. Um, because we see Degreed as effectively that very much that one-stop shop. Um, we also want to fill in the gaps on that ecosystem architecture. And one gap that we see is around our VR architecture. Um, we also, we've, you've heard a lot so far about skills. 
and we are trying to create a new skills ecosystem as well, where people can really both at an individual level, but also at an organization level, really recognize where their skill gaps are. Um, we've of course got degreed for learning in that one stop shop. Um, we also, where it comes to more traditional learning, we want an easy requesting, that people don't find it tough to engage. And then comes the fun stuff at the end. So it's, which we want people to get new learning experiences. Um, so that is part of the, you know, if what does learning mean in Ericsson, then it is partly about getting new ways of learning to be different. So we're looking into things like VR, virtual assistants, and so on. So that's a little bit what we're doing. What it all adds up to at the end of the day is around making learning a whole lot easier for our employees. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you, actually. I know I promised you just one, but I have two. Um, uh, surprise questions. <laughs> oh, <blimey. laughs> so um, you talked quite a lot there about linking your learning strategy to organisational strategy. Mm. And, and I work with uh, you know, a, a, a large number of clients across our region. And the one thing that I would say they consistently struggle surprisingly to articulate is, um, or not surprisingly actually, um, is the link between what they're trying to do with their learning tech and how that gives them competitive advantage. So I'd be interested to hear how easy or difficult you found that within Ericsson. I know it's a tough one, so I apologise. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough question. But that's why we're all here, um, right? <laughs> So, so um, uh, how does it give us competitive edge? Um, well, I think one is, is it, to some extent, it comes down to your business cases yeah. for your technology. Mm. Um, so I think when the tech, the, partly around some of the business cases we've mm. had, is around how can you get people up, skilled up yeah. faster and quicker. Yeah. Um, if life, if, if it is easier uh, and, and more efficient to become skilled, then you're going to become skilled, then, then you're going to save money at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's one way. And I think about also about having in place the consultative skills mm. that enables you to have those skills targeted. Yeah. And so you're very clear in the different parts of the organization. And we do things like, we call them line of sight workshops, um, where you can, see, you can see, if you like, the line of sight from what the business goals are, right through yeah. to what the learning requirements are. Yeah. Um, and then if that is then supported by the technologies, you know, the, if you like, the technologies are in the supporting act. Completely agree, yeah. Yeah. And, and it was interesting, I don't know how many of you were in the session this morning that Christy um, Broom uh, moderated and, and Darren Bartlett, I think, who's in this room, was talking about Imperial Brands and, and was telling exactly the same story, you know, around saying, actually, technology is just the enabler. It, it shouldn't be what writes your strategy. And I think, you know, some, some clients start from that place and it's, it's always really interesting to part way through the journey, see them kind of pivoting around from, oh yeah, and they have that, that moment of, of realisation. So thank you, I appreciate that one on the question. Um, the second question for you is just around, because um, Peter and I have had a number of conversations around this, and one story that he tells super well is about stakeholders um, within the organisation and how um, it's really important to engage key stakeholders um, in the, your kind of journey and the things that you're trying to do with learning. So do you want to just talk a little bit about that stakeholder group as well? Yeah, and I, and I, I think there's one, there's, there's a, of course there's a few different stakeholders that you have to rely on. We've talked about internal comms and so on. But if there's one stakeholder that really matters in the, when you're creating around your technology ecosystem, it's of course the IT team. Um, and, uh, and I think that's one thing that we recognise quite early on. Um, was we've done, you know, we've introduced new learning technologies in very different ways at different times. Um, and the ones that have been more successful um, have generally got IT on board from day one. So when we've not done that, um, you kind of play a whole lot of catch up later on. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, when it came to, for example, with Kaltura, which is our video platform, with Degreed, 
we wanted to get IT on board really from the start. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was having, an, uh, when we, had, we created the degree project, for example, we, we created an IT stream. Um, and that, and we put somebody from IT in charge of that stream. Nice. And, and that got immediately, immediate buy-in. And for me, the, the ultimate test of all this was, we have like, a, like I'm sure many of you do, a product council where you've got to get the final tick in the box. Now, of course, we did loads of preparation around that, but who took it to that product council? It was actually IT, because by the time we got there, yeah. they were actually on our side. Big advocates for the product, which yeah, is a, exactly. a huge achievement because, like you say, you know, there's there's millions of stakeholder groups that we all have to work with and engage for these these pieces of work. But there are some that can make your life very difficult if mm. you don't engage them properly and turn in, you know, some of those work stream leaders into advocates. It's a huge achievement. So um, that's all the questions I have for you. Okay. <laughs> so let's give Thanks, people a round of applause. <laughs> And then taking the stage next, uh, Kylie and Rich from uh, Booking.com. So I'm just going to hand over to those guys now. Thanks, Chrissy. Hi, everyone. So um, Kylie and I are just going to take you through how we implemented uh, Degreed at Booking.com. Um, but I want to just start off by asking if everybody who knows who Booking.com is. Because, yeah. <laughs> OK, good. Um, but for those of you who don't, we are the global leader in online reservations. Um, and we are, we're across 220 territories and we have 18,000 employees. So our, our user group is spread right across the world and we're a, an English only company. So that's our, our main communication language, our main uh, learning language as well. Um, so Pierre talked about it a bit there as well, but how we connected our, our learning philosophy right through to our, our company mission. Um, was really the key as how to how we actually made sure that everybody is pointing in the same direction when it comes to uh, our business efforts. And this is our our um, our mission statement here. I just want to read through it. Um, our belief is that life is made of shared experiences, however big or small. Nothing should stand in their way. That's why we are on a mission to make it easier for everyone to experience the world. We promise we promise access to everyone to all life's experiences whenever, wherever, and however it best suits them. Our proof will be the widest choice, best value, and the easiest experience. So this is something that we always hold quite close to our hearts and helps us all move in the, for the direction together, as I was saying. And we actually created a learning philosophy based on that mission statement. Um, this was very important for us to keep that red thread, so all the way from the leaders who were devising the business strategy all the way down to the learning teams with the learning philosophy right here. Um, like travelling, learning is a continuous process of curiosity, exploration and creating memorable experiences. So that memorable experiences part, creating those mem memorable experiences, if you remember the previous slide, it's all about experiences. And that's really where we see the benefit of Degreed because it does allow the user to have that experience uh, as well as uh, the, the way that customers experience our platform. But it's a little bit, that's a little bit fluffy, but what does that mean? How do we drill that down? Because we quite often see these philosophical statements, etc., etc. And it really comes down to these three points here. Um, first of all, investing in continuous learning. And that's just about, Peter, you said it really well, about building a habit getting users and learners to, to have that habit of learning constantly. That it's something that they want to do, they want to drive themselves, they want to improve themselves. And with Degreed, you can do that with the self-directed pathways, with skill plans. Maybe I want to improve my coaching. I'm going to follow a, a coaching skill plan. Um, so it's, it's really about building that habit. Um, culture of learning, promoting that culture of learning. And I think we're quite lucky in booking because we don't need to work too much about promoting this culture of learning, but more maintaining it. Um, we've generated a lot of interest with Degreed. Um, it was a big jump from where we were before, and the business has taken that on a lot, so the, the affinity to learn and to use the platform is there. So it's just about maintaining that and, and making sure that we can continue with that. Um, 
and I think that's really about the social interaction. So whilst kind of those conversations happen around the coffee machine about, hey, I need to do some presentation skills uh, training because I, I don't feel confident about it, um, I can also do that in, in the grid where I can maybe follow a skill plan around presentation skills. I can leave some comments, some takeaways, um, or I could even share that bit of content or assign it to, to Kylie, my colleague, if she, if she needed some of these. Um, and it really allows for that social interaction. I think that's one of the biggest things for the grid that we saw in our organization. And again, like believing in the, the power of every employee, um, making sure that everyone is accounted for and everyone is, is thought about. So that goes from, again, from the CEO all the way down to our CS agents, making sure that they have the opportunity to have the right learning in front of them at the right time. And going into the grid, yeah, you have your, you have your feed and all that content is there for you to, to actually zoom in and be uh, your feed. So I'm going to hand over to Kylie now, who's going to go through a little bit more step by step on, on how we got this implementation through. Yeah. So like Richard said, we really wanted to create a personalized learning experience for every employee at Booking. And so as we were getting ready to implement Degreed, we were looking for ways that we could really customize that learning experience. Um, and I'm going to walk you through a couple of the different ways that we actually did that. We started out with looking to customize the onboarding experience. And if you're not familiar with the Degreed onboarding experience, it's uh, when a user logs in for the first time, they go through uh, a couple of questions where they pick their role within the organization, and then they're um, suggested a few skills that are relevant to that role. So what that does, it, it allows the platform to be customized right off the bat for what the uh, learner wants to focus on. And we wanted to make that as booking specific as possible. So what we did is we partnered with our business stakeholders across the organization and looked at what roles do you have in your department and what are the skills that those roles need now and in the future so that when a booking employee logs in, they're able to find their job title and then their suggested skills that we know are relevant to them. And that means that the first time they log in, the first five minutes that they're on the platform, they already feel like it's tailored to them. We were also able to leverage that information by doing that legwork up front. We were able to leverage that information with our learning partners in the organization to kind of um, tailor our focus on, on what we needed to do to prepare for the implementation. And that's where the day one preparation workshops came in. Our team met with each of our learning teams and said, these are the skills that your audience is going to be presented with. What can you do? What can you build that's going to be relevant to them? So what pathways do we need to curate that, that uh, will help them build these skills? What groups do we need to create that are going to be relevant for them in their roles? And that really helped our learning teams to not necessarily feel like we need to have everything done by day one, right? We can focus our efforts and have more of an impact. The last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, we, and I think this is one of the best things that, that we did, is we gave early access to a group of people. And we're lucky enough, like Richard said, we have a very strong learning culture. And we identified uh, users across the globe, uh, different levels, and targeted them as learning champions. All of them had in common that they were already really passionate about learning. They had already developed that learning muscle, and they were already doing it in their day to day. And by doing this, we were not only able to leverage them as promotion, promoters within the business, they were talking about it, helping their colleagues get signed up, but they were also using the platform, adding takeaways, sharing content, joining groups, so what, when the rest of the users joined, their learning feed was already full of content that their colleagues were consuming. So it was relevant right off the bat, and it was a huge success. The other group that we gave early access to was our leadership team. And that was really important for us because we wanted our leaders to be role models. We wanted them to understand what the platform had to offer and how they could leverage it to support their teams and the business. And that was another, uh, another huge win for us. And as with any uh, technology investment, you always go in with a set of uh, metrics or goals that you're trying to meet. 
And our goal was within, one of our goals was within the first three months, we wanted over 80% of our users to log in. And we were actually able to beat that. And in less than two months, we had over 80% of our users log in for the first time, which was awesome. This was great, but it gets even better <laughs> because what's more important is that the users are coming back and building that muscle and we had over 70% of those users coming back for more. And that goes into the continuous learning. They wanted to keep coming back and keep, keep experiencing the platform. And that was a huge success for us. So we are, are excited about all that Degree has to offer and looking now to continue building that. Awesome. Yeah. OK, so surprise, surprise, I have a question for you. <laughs> um, so. Um, oh, thank you. So you talked a lot about um, engaging your users and you, the numbers speak for themselves, right? Having 71% of your um, audience engaged and returning is a huge achievement. Um, and I guess what I'd like to know, and I think pretty much everyone in this room would like to know is, you know, how did you really engage your audiences? What sort of I don't want to talk tactically about kind of launch and marketing, but I guess let's kind of start there and talk a little bit about how you engage your audiences to kind of get these numbers. Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, we, le we wanted to leverage our, our leadership and we really focused on activating our people managers. And while we, while we want to encourage owning your own development, obviously, as you all know, people managers play a big role in employee development. So we're looking at how can we get our managers to leverage Degreed in those conversations, right? And share content with their team that they know is going to help them develop. Uh, I think that was a huge, a huge win. And I also think that one of the other things that we tried to do is um, man or leverage our different learning teams, right? Because they know their audience is the best. Yeah. We have a tech learning department. We have a CS learning department. So we're giving them the information that they need in order to target their own audience. Sure. So we know that in tech, they really like to develop their own learning content because they are the subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. So we helped the tech team have what they called activator workshops, and they had these subject matter experts coming in, and we were teaching them how to use the platform and how to build a pathway so that they could go and, and create these pathways and share them with their peers. Awesome. And so I think it's just really getting to understand your audience and then pinpoint those uh, pieces of the platform that they are going to appreciate the most. Cool, no, that's great, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna go tactical a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah. So what, the first thing that we kind of asked here in, in the room is does everybody know who Booking.com is, right? And, and more or less everybody put their hand up and said, yeah, they do. So you guys are great consumer marketers, right? You have a great product, we're all using it. Did you kind of take any of that consumer-led marketing and apply any of that to your degree launch? So I get all those things that you kind of spoke about, you know, segmenting your stakeholders, getting everybody, you know, going in the right direction, engaging their audiences. But was there anything kind of over and above that that was a bit marketing that you kind of did? A bit marketing is English. <laughs> I think what we did, <coughs> excuse me, I think what we did a lot of was, was user testing. Awesome. So um, really by, yeah, going out, getting some, some users, a focus group, sitting down with them and working out what they did like, what they didn't like. Um, but not just working on their wants, okay. also taking in consideration their needs. Awesome. Because I think that that's one thing that can quite easily uh, take up your time and send yeah. you down the wrong direction is if they want something is to give them something yeah so more to look at what they need rather than what they want yeah um so when it comes to the the marketing side of that it's it's basically uh, again what kylie talked about was about teaching them how to fish mm -hmm. rather than just giving them fish mm -hmm. so teaching them how to use the system and say hey look you know you can you can search here in the top right hand corner if you're on Google and you find an article, you can use the bookmarklet to add it to your own pathway. You can then create a pathway for your, uh, for your team or whatever. So really showing them that. And the more we sh showed them, the more that they got involved with it and the more they wanted to use it. And now it's kind of got to that point 
where people are so excited about it, they're kind of trying to outdo each other with nice. cool things that you can do on, on Degreed, so that's really exciting. Um, so it's really flourished, and I think it, it, just, it just took off on its own almost with yeah. this uh, perpetual nature of, right. of continual learning. Awesome. I think one thing, if we're talking about really tactical mm. uh, marketing, we decided that we needed a really strong brand okay. um, to, to stand out, right? Because <laughs> there's a little bit of platform fatigue in our, in our organization, and uh, we wanted to make sure it was really clear what, what are we providing, what do you, what do, you do here? So we, we branded it, we had some nice marketing videos that we used, so it was really clear on what we were launching how they can leverage it, mm -hmm. um, and not to get confused with, you know, like our social platforms or things like that. Awesome. Thanks, guys. That's so, cute. Awesome. so our plan now was, to, and these guys are going to kill me, because our plan now was to kind of go to an exercise and have you guys, you know, get involved, and, and these, Kylie and, and Rich are going to brief you on that, but I think looking at the very stressful countdown timer that we have here, <laughs> we probably have some time for some questions. So I just want to pause at this point and see if any of you have any questions that you want to ask these guys while we've got them here. We will have more time for Q&A after the exercise, but just while this is fresh in your mind, is there any questions you guys have? Awesome. We've got a mic runner just behind you, so perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, maybe. On, on Expedia, no, I'm sorry. <gasps> oh, 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 but I mean, the first draft was by hunch or by asking or by just going through the platforms because we're trying to do the same in our company. But do we, we, we are also wondering if they, they do it. But now we want to recognize them. We mm -hmm. want to put uh, some of their time. Well, they are doing it on their spare time, let's say. So mm -hmm. we want to do something more formal and we want to ask uh, the, the management to, to figure out who is uh, uh, learning, a lifelong learner. How did you do that and how are you uh, recognizing these people or making some, some, I don't know, special conditions for them to keep on doing it? Or did you do something like that? Yeah, so I think there was a couple of different ways that we were able to target them. One thing that's nice about having departmental learning teams is they are close, they sit closer to the learners, right? So they already had some people who they saw as champions within their department. But then we were also able to leverage the platforms that we already had, uh, like LinkedIn Learning and Udemy, to see who, who are the super users, right? Who are, who's already going out and, and consuming the content. And then we also have a platform, um, Workplace, the so Facebook at Work, and people were, were sharing articles, uh, writing blog posts, like they were already doing some of that stuff, so that was really some of the key ways that we were um, targeting them. And then uh, for the early access, I think that was like one of the, the best ways to recognize and really positioning it as like, because you invest in yourself, because you're a lifelong learner, guess what, you get early access to this platform and you get to be our champions and, and posi positioning it as like a reward almost, you know? And I think on top of that, the, the champions, not only do they help drive the interest of the, of the platform of learning in general, but after, after the implementation, of course, issues arise from time to time. And there's only five of us in the core team who were involved in the implementation. So yeah, we don't have enough hands on deck to do that. So these champions also would chime in with comments. So people would say, hey, I, I don't know what this button does, or it didn't do what I expected it to do. Uh, what's up with that? So then one of the champions would kind of drop in and, hey, uh, no problem, I can help you with that, I'll message you offline type of thing. So that was another yeah. benefit to that as well, that the, sure. the maintenance on, on ongoing is, is important. And perhaps just uh, I, I perhaps just build on what Richard said as well, because we, we use champions as well in, uh, in Ericsson. And uh, 
Um, I think what is really important once, once you've done your implementation is that you don't forget them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and we try to avoid that in a couple of ways. You know, one is through their own education, through their own learning. So we've ran like every couple of weeks session with the champions to increase their understanding, increase their capability with degree. Uh, and, and I think they've really valued that. Um, and I think the second piece is we brought them into our governance process as well. So we have a, a content governance board, which we're just kind of starting to find our way with. Um, and one person on that is from the group of champions. Mm -hmm. So if you can find ways to kind of, kind of keep them engaged, kind of I'd say beyond the swag, um, then, uh, then that's really important. Great, thank you. We have another question here? Just a, just a quick question. Uh, Peter, you just said it, governance. It's an important word, actually, we hear this a lot. And you guys at Booking, too, it sounds, a lot of it has to do with enablement, right? Um, and, and governance is an interesting one. And I think that many uh, of you in this room as well are probably struggling with that. You know, to which degree do we let the, you know, let the reins go and let just the whole ecosystem take off? Or to which degree do we control it? I want to hear from the panel also what your perspective is, because we're learning from other companies as well that, for example, when they're completely letting the reins go, that the curation process takes on its own life and actually completely new um, methodologies emerge that have nothing to do with traditional instructional design but are yet the most popular and are working the best. So I'd be curious to hear from the panel also what you guys are experiencing and the sort of various levels of governance to which degree you guys are letting go or still holding the reins. So, so I can question, start yeah. off if you yeah. like. Um, but the, uh, I, I think there is a great range from you know, companies that have total control over what the, uh, the, the learning pathways and plans created to probably companies more like ours that, that, have, that allow everybody to some extent to create their own pathway and plan. But what we've, what we've zeroed in on, I guess, is the taxonomy. So if you like the naming convention. Um, so uh, if, if you are somebody, if, if we have like a global learning pathway or, or plan, uh, then we, it gets endorsed. Uh, and it also has, it's then known as the Ericsson Academy, whatever, you know. Um, if it's a, if it's a, um, pathway that is owned by a particular organization, then, we, then that organization prefixes it. So people can very easily tell which are the globally sponsored uh, pathways and plans. And then we've put the control in, if you like, around the featuring, you know, the featuring element within the browse functionality and degree. Um, so that has to go, who gets featured and who doesn't comes into the governance board. So that's the balance that we've struck. Um, we are worried, if I'm honest, about kind of scrap learning. And are we going to end up with even more learning that we don't want out there, you know, which is perhaps where people are learning the wrong things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we are worried about that. And we've had to have a history a little bit of in our old LMSs and so on of too much being created. So that's, that's kind of where we've struck the balance. But pretty much similar for us as well when it comes to um, governance um, of course anyone can make a pathway we encourage that we, we encourage the SMEs to go out and do that um, but how do we identify a pathway maybe made by an SME or made by someone who isn't so knowledgeable about that we have branding so we have um, yeah the thumbnail for the the pathway or the plan it's quite identifiable and that gets used for, for that. So if you're scrolling through all of these pathways, um, you see the ones that stand out. And our branding is it's, it's very colorful and very strong. And we also use this endorsement as well to, mm. to highlight the fact that, hey, this does come from a reliable source. Um, at the same time, you know, we're, keeping an, we're keeping, a look, uh, keeping an eye on the insights. So if we notice you know, a spike in activity for one particular pathway, we're going to check that out. Yeah. And again, we've got the support of our functional learning teams to the, the customer service learning team, for example. They'll, they'll take a look into that on their, their CS users and what they are doing. So if there's any issues, they can then flag it. Yeah. I think one thing that's really exciting to me about Degreed is that it's, 
It's providing an opportunity for us to shift as learning professionals and to have more impact in the organization and help the organization achieve key business goals. And by enabling our subject matter experts to build those functional pathways, those subject matter expert, their topic pathways, it, it frees up our time to, to focus on the, on the skills and the, the impact that we can have in a, in a broader sense, right? We get to focus on the skills for tomorrow while the subject matter experts are owning their subject matter. So I think it's, it's a really exciting time. We're on a, on a process to get there because it's a big change for our learning teams, but I think it's a, it's a really great uh, time to be. Cool. Darcy from my healthcare perspective. Yeah, we're, we're not living in that world yet. <laughs> um, like I said, we started with, well, maybe roughly, and I'm looking at one of my colleagues, <laughs> eight learning management systems, system-wide. Um, eight learning management systems, heavy, heavy, 85, 90% instructor-led training, don't really know how to use Yammer, they're not connected, they're bedside, you know, they're nurses and doctors and medical assistants, and um, they're not. We don't have a lot of the things, nor have we in play. So when we looked at implementing Degreed, um, we're baby stepping into it because we're pivoting from go into HealthStream, which is our learning management system. We have 25,000 pieces of content out there and no management of it, no taxonomy, um, no naming conventions for the most part. Uh, <laughs> and so we are very fearful that if we were to open the door completely, to the organization at this point in time, we would have another health stream. Um, and health stream has gotten to a point where it's really not usable or a value to our caregivers. Um, we rank in the top three from an engagement survey standpoint of um, career development is one of the top three reasons why our caregivers leave our organization. And that's why we're investing in different ways of doing things. So for us to pivot, what we have done is we do have governance set up we have style guides, um, taxonomy, um, as well as naming conventions, and we will go through the process of opening it up to certain folks um, within the organization to build pathways, but we are not letting people at this point yet free for all. Um, the other thing is we're in healthcare, and what people post could be um, devastating. So we also need to make sure that safety and reliability um, are curated and we have the right people reviewing content. Yeah. So we're gonna baby step. It's gonna be a phased approach. Um, I know one of the folks on our team is ready to cut loose and I drive him crazy <laughs> because I'm like, Wah. Um, and maybe it's because I am a more, I've been around, I've been around for a long, long time in learning and this is very different. Um, way so for us the, what I needed to and what we needed to do and I would ask all of you to do to be successful is manage your organizational readiness in regards to the volume of change mm -hmm. um, and what it's going to look like and if you're kind of where we're at in the world with they go into a learning management system they sign up for a class life is good I watch an e-learning and um, they may not be ready for um, to just for you to go go explore and be um, we needed to be much more directive. So how we're driving implementation is not through we're standing up degreed because one of the concerns in our um, area is we are so exhausted with change right now, as many of your organizations are too. And if we were to free for all degreed, people would go, oh my God, it's just one more thing. Learning's making mm -hmm. us do one more thing. And um, we didn't want it to be like that. So the experience that we're trying to drive is pinpoint solutions. So the first thing that's gonna be coming out that's fairly broad is gonna be our virtual career center. Mm. And so we're gonna launch it in Degreed, but we're not calling out Degreed or we've branded it Rise for um, our organization. We're not launching, it's this new platform because people are gonna go, oh great, now we have Hellstream and 17 other platforms, super. <laughs> Um, what we're doing is saying, you have this virtual career center where you can go and drive your career, and then they will go in, their access point is through Degreed, and we'll start to build momentum there. So it doesn't look like it's one more thing. 
Um, and what we're doing is then underlying all those learning management systems underneath it um, as we go forward. So that's, we're a little bit different, but we're, we're not as super cool, hip, and fun um, as booking, <laughs> booking.com. But I think the great thing about having such varied um, clients on our panel is ex for, for questions exactly like that, because not all of our clients can just free range, you know? And, and that's the reality of the world that we all live and work in, right? So it's great to hear that perspective as well as, you know, everything that kind of goes in between the, the two. So thank you guys for answering those questions. Um, we'll have some more time for Q&A um, in a little while, but I'm going to hand back to, to the... Um, to the guys from Booking who are going to brief you on our exercise, which means we're going to turn the tables a little bit. Please don't leave, it's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> Lock the doors. So, uh, Kylie, I'm just going to pass the clicker back down to you. So, um, yeah, there you go. So, I wanted, before we get going on the activity, I wanted to give some um, context or tell you a little story about our own experience key learning we had and it, it goes back to uh, the big change that comes along with implementing new technology and like we've said we were lucky enough that our learning community was hungry for it our employees were hungry for this change so we didn't have to worry too much about our end users but what we learned as we were going through is that our, our learning professionals within the organization were maybe not as ready for the big change because it, it was shifting the way that we did our work. It was completely changing the way that we were going to work as learning professionals. And our, um, traditionally, Booking.com has still heavily relied on classroom training. And that's expensive, it's not scalable, especially for a global company. And we needed to move to a more blended approach, which obviously Degreed really can help us do. Um, but we found that a lot of our learning teams were looking at, okay, how do I take what's in our LMS and put it right into Degreed? Instead of looking at how can we take our existing programs, maybe innovate them a little bit, and really leverage the technology and what Degreed has to offer to make an even better learning experience for our, for our audience. So one thing that I thought might be helpful for us to do today is to help build that story that you can leverage in your business. So whether it's building a business case to take to your leadership team or a change management plan to help get your learning professionals on board or a story to help uh, engage your learners, I think it's really important to have a really strong message to send on what are we trying to achieve and how is technology going to help us get there. So. On your tables, you'll see there, there are some uh, worksheets, and it just has three questions that you can answer that'll help you build what that story looks like. Um, we thought it might be best to take about 10 minutes to just discuss these questions um, as a group, share your ideas, and then we'll take some time to uh, hear from you guys on anything that you learned from these conversations. Is there anything, Peter or Darcy, you'd add to the kind of brief around what people might want to think about um, when they're sort of thinking about those questions? Any? It's fine if the answer's no. I just want to make sure that you... I'd, I'd just go back to what I was saying earlier around uh, alignment. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're trying to... Well, what I think enables this to... Uh, all of us to succeed is to see that alignment yeah. from, you know, what's your business strategy to your learning strategy yeah. to what, what you're trying to achieve out of your technologies. Mm -hmm. It's no harder than that, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although that's easy to say <laughs> yeah. and hard to yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. And, and part of the reason why we call the exercise connecting the dots is because that's exactly what we're trying to kind of give you the the questions to be able to do. It's kind of like this is where we are as an L and D functional. This is where we are as a tech function or where, whatever function you're in. But how do you really connect up within your organisation to really be able to see how you could drive competitive advantage through? you know, learning tech or tech within your business. So like Kylie said, 10 minutes. Um, you guys have any questions along the way, just, just shout and we'll, we'll do our best to clarify them. Um, but then once the 10 minutes is up and we've got this stressful countdown timer here, so we're gonna know exactly when it's up. Um, we'll ask a couple of you guys just to share back with us and hopefully you won't be too shy. Um, so yeah, where you go, any questions, let us know. We'll give you 10 minutes. I'm that annoying person that's going to say annoying things now, like, we're, we're all that stand between you now and a cup of coffee. Um, so we're just going to hop to maybe two or three people 
um, and see if you guys want to share some of your um, findings or your thoughts on those three really thought-provoking questions. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and see who wants to talk here. I promised this table kind of in the middle here that I would come to them first. So if no one else pipes up, I'm going to volunteer them <laughs> that it's their turn. Oh, yeah. Do you guys have anything for me? Don't be shy. We're not going to be mean. Do you, oh, great. Perfect. We have a mic runner. One sec. It's Linda, really. I should call her Linda, not Linda. mic runner. <laughs> Sorry, Linda. I got to sit over here with our friends, and we started talking a lot about sales learning, Yeah. Uh, specifically being such a difficult uh, but necessary cohort to engage in. You came over and gave us some great insight about spatial learning. Great. And the, the business case around how do we integrate things in a way and connect the dots in such a way that our salespeople know that they can't afford not to have this knowledge, but mm -hmm. getting it at the right time in the right quantity um, for busy people with low attention span who absolutely can't live without this technology and this information. We, yeah. we talked a lot about how do we create a compelling business case yes. that would make our sales teams feel like, I'll make time for this. Yeah, awesome. And, and I had a conversation somewhere in the back over here about how you um, stop thinking of yourselves as L&D people who just do tactical things. Like we just deliver sales training programs or we just deliver product training programs and try to really take a step back and think about how those sales training programs that you roll out actually contribute to the bottom line, which contributes to your organizational strategy, which contributes to your business as a whole. You know, we aren't just people who deliver face-to-face -face courses or procure e-learning or do whatever it is we do. We're contributing to, to our organizations. And I think that's a really big thing that we sometimes forget when we get really tactical and we get down into the weeds. So that's a great example. Thank you so much for sharing. Awesome. Do you guys want to add anything to that? I, I think. Oh, go ahead. I think it's a really good point about um, that we're in learning to help solve problems mm. um, and help the and and I think that's almost a, a point, a transition point in any learning organisation to look and say, to what extent are the people in my learning team actually helping to solve business problems? Mm. And, uh, and it may, of course, not be that learning is not the right choice for mm. doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but when you start to adopt that mindset in your, in your learning organization, I think you've, you've reached a new level, would be my view. Great, thank you. Carly, you were going to say something. I think, too, when you're, when you're looking at specific audiences or specific uh, programs, you have to be able to build that strong story and you have to be able to market it, right? So if we're looking at the future skills that we need as learning and development professionals, it's really marketing and storytelling. We need to be able to tell the story to any level of our audience and be able to, to tell them the what's in it for me so that they're able to get the most out of it that they can. Great, thank you. So anybody else brave enough to share their thoughts? You look like brave people when I first came in. <laughs> no one, really? Casey, what about your table? <laughs> <laughs> he gives me so much stick, you guys. This is the only thing I can do right now. I know, I know. Uh, I don't know if you'd call on me. Uh, we, we sort of kind of follow the directions, <laughs> if that surprises you. It surprises me, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, we were, we were actually spending a little bit of time, and I say we, it was not with me, it was Dina, but uh, talking about how do you start to look at all the different <coughs> systems and uh, that you're connecting your ecosystem and make them useful for people. So uh, talking about changing performance management suites and how that can work, where you start to have alignment with goals and performance reviews and regular feedback right. and the skills you're building, and not make that just a static, on-demand place that nobody ever goes back and all those things go to die because they're still really important. Mm -hmm. But how do you then marry that with things that are transactable on a daily basis? So uh, how do I take these skills and the goals and objectives I have and then turn that into something that I'm feeding people daily to grow and match to careers and match to roles and give them a transactable ecosystem so that they want to participate. So a lot of this comes down to, we are talking about just how do you get people to engage with all of this? Mm. Because we, we build these really robust systems of learning and tools and resources 
But until we get people to want to participate in it, it doesn't really work. So we have to be able to connect the dots for them, using your words, but uh, connect all those dots on the, on the system so that people want to participate and see how the value to them works as you go all the way through the process. Okay. Okay. So firstly, awesome. Great example. Um, and, and I really appreciate you stepping up to the plate there because I did put you on the spot. Secondly, you guys will see why I ask Casey questions because I can rely on him to fill a good minute or so. <laughs> <laughs> Your mic's off now. You're out. The mic's off. <laughs> Anybody else want to contribute? I promise I won't mind you up. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'm new to my organization and we're in utilities. So it's, we have a lot of similarities to what you were describing in healthcare. We have uh, people in the field. Um, we have a lot of regulation and things that we need to be careful of. We have an old system with 25,000 pieces of junk, honestly. <laughs> um, and I think what's, what I'm thinking about is um, the organization has for a long time given a bad user experience mm. with bad delivery and now we're thinking about how to market it, but if we just have a good user experience, right, with good delivery, um, I don't think it's as insurmountable um, because we've created patterns yeah. in there. Um, and I, I think people are ready for it in a lot of different times and ways. They're exhausted by sitting there too, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's what's exciting. Thank you. Do you guys want to add any? Anything to that? Any unconscious? I just keep yeah. talking all the time. I, I would just say I think you're spot on, at least. Um, and before I was in healthcare, I was in manufacturing, and we had um, printer manufacturing, and and um, and we had field service folks as well as our sales folks, heavily distributed global organization, and. Um, and I think you're spot on. I don't think the thing that we needed to be careful of is that, like you, we had 25,000 pieces of crappy e-learning to where, can I say crappy? You can, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is not the BBC. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> um, so we are in the USA. Um, so uh, one of the things that we had to be really clear as we are pivoting um, as part of our change management plan is that HealthStream, we're still backing up to HealthStream, so when you go through this great experience, you might land on something that's not so great still because we're still in build mode. We're still redesigning, we're still thinking. So we needed to have that caveat so people didn't give up on it quickly. quickly. Um, we also needed to tell our um, leadership that we needed to invest in redesign. So one of the things that we did is we have um, 1.3 million assignments each year to our caregivers, which means that I, you got assigned something to take, um, which is a very push mentality. Um, and we reduced that down this last year to 350,000 assignments, which seems not like 350,000 is still a lot, but that's $22 million down to $8 million of time. And so those numbers get really big and really real, and I think it's Think about that when you're trying to influence your CFO for to pay, you know, a mil plus for an experience platform when you can redesign and redesign cost it, didn't really cost us much. Um, we have designers and they're going through and doing that work. So um, you can get really creative on how to manage your learning investment better when you build that business case. So I think you're spot on. Right. And, I, and I think just to add to that, I, one one reflection I have when I look at what we've done over the last. 10 years or so in, in Ericsson around learning is that we, we, firstly, we recognized we had to move away from instructor-led learning. Mm -hmm. So then we go to e-learning. Then we get stuck in e-learning for a bit. Yeah, it's kind of a story resonating with a few of you. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and uh, and, and we, we went even further because what we did was we created SharePoint sites you know, with lots of uh, e-learning in them and they became the e-learning repository the and then suddenly everybody's <laughs> bored with e-learning yeah. sites. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then we moved to video. And video, you know, we, we launched Kaltura, which was, we called Ericsson Play. And mm -hmm. what I think we as learning people have to learn ourselves is that, that actually it's not about one method over another. Mm -hmm. It's about right, finding the right method at the right time. Yeah. 
And you know, we're looking at you know new sexy things, uh, and I guess we're allowed to say that as well. You are. Um, <laughs> and uh, 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 like virtual reality, the, the, it's not going to be the be all and end all in virtual reality. There are some things that around that virtual reality is really strong with, mm. and we should use them for that. Mm -hmm. But other times, we're going to use video, straightforward yeah. video and courses. So yeah, that would be my reflection. And that's such a key point. There is, is I think. I, I so, so um, can relate to what you're talking about there. If you know, and if all of us kind of drew our journey as L&D people, we would all probably go through something quite similar. You know, <coughs> now we got stuck in the e-learning bit for a bit. Then we went to the SharePoint portal where we kind of filtered things and we connected people with learning. But I think one of the great thing about one of the great things about having you guys here today is having you all be able to talk about your ecosystems and not just you know, the LXP in isolation, how that relates to you know, how you're pulling in different pieces of content from different places, and how it isn't just one answer to everything and one size fits all. Because I think we've all probably made that mistake in the past and lived to tell the tale, barely. Um, so I'm going to ask for one more from, from out there of you guys, if anybody is willing to share. Just one more, and then we'll move to q and I'm looking at you. She's not even, she's like, she's not looking at me. It's not like. <laughs> Anybody? Bueller? Please? <laughs> oh, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> you took pity on me. Is that second, please? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, hey, my name's Bill. I'm from uh, Verizon. So, I would say, you know, I was a little hesitant to share it only because I think some of it is similar to what's been yeah. said. Um, but, you know, as far as our learning strategy, it ties to what we call purposeful continuous learning. Yeah, awesome. um, Because like a lot of other big companies, we have a, a good, you know, half of our business is customer-facing frontline folks, folks in stores, folks on the call centers, or in the call centers. But then we have another big half that's building out our network and engineering, uh, IT, as well as kind of knowledge workers. So we call it purposeful continuous because we need to be purposeful with the folks that are in the front line, because we need to get them to what you said, the yeah. right learning at the right time. Yeah. Um, but then continuous, because we really have kind of focused on those frontline folks a lot, that we now need to kind of focus back on the knowledge workers, the folks that do have a little more discretionary time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think the the one thing is at least. In, so I'm, I'm volunteering, but I'm also because I'd like some feedback. Um, <laughs> is because. You know, I think part of the challenge is that what you talked about, being able to meet folks where they are, where they're ready. Yeah. Like, we have parts of the business, you know, that want to talk about skills and career and, and do the roles and skills mapping. And then we have other folks that are like, okay, I'm in a call center. If you're not familiar with that environment, they're scheduled down to the minute mm -hmm. of what they do, right? And we can't even get those folks to give us maybe time off the phone. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. think part of the challenge is, you know, my team has to serve the entire enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to kind of adjust what we say and who we're saying, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things to because we, we have to, to understand are they kind of on the purposeful, like they're just used to getting what they need and then that's, that's learning, mm -hmm. period. Or are they the folks that are hungry and are curious? Um, because we believe, my, my, we believe they can all get to the continuous, but I think it's recognized in the reality that some folks are, you know, not, you can, you can take 15 minutes off, take your online training, and that's it. So, yeah. so, yeah. so I mean, the only, uh, so far, because we, we just launched a few months ago, so mm -hmm. we, we had to just kind of get it out there. Mm -hmm. So far, what we're trying to do, at least initially, and if folks have better ideas, feel free, um, is to just try to, not only meet folks where they are, mm. but use them to hopefully kind of encourage each other, because there is kind of that FOMO, that gotta, yeah. you know, get what's what's happening, what's what's working. So we're just trying to leverage that a little bit so far, but it's too early on, so I can't you know, say how well it's <laughs> really working yet. That's, I mean, that's a, a, I'd say probably quite a common problem statement that you're sharing, which is, is great to hear. Uh, before I let these intelligent people answer that question, I just want to see who else in the room is facing into a, a similar challenge. Yeah? Yeah. It's a, it's, co it's a common challenge, and I think it's a really great question, so thank you for, um, for posing it and for, for asking for some input on it. So, 
you got it. What do you have to add? Maybe I can say something. Yeah, that. And that's the second time I've heard this kind of moment of need, the right timing. And I think you, you mentioned that as well. And that was something when we spoke to our, our business, the, the leaders, when we asked them, when do you, when do you learn? And they said, well, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't have time for it because it's not linked to my business objectives and my KPIs. So that's what I focus on first and I prioritise that. And if I've got any time left, then maybe I'll do some learning. So then it started to lead us to questions like, so what is learning for you? And learning for them was e-learnings, it was going to a classroom training, it was reading an article, pretty much those things. But we started to then have go further with conversations around, so is it only in those moments that you learn? Or can there be other things that you're, where you're learning? And by that meaning the conversation you've had around the coffee machine, maybe that was, <clears throat> maybe you can take something away from that. Or it was on a feedback with your manager where you have your, your quarterly review. Or you, you have a, a quick coffee with your manager. Having, having these moments that are not seen as traditional learning uh, interventions, let's say, but are very informal, but we can still take things away from them. So that's something we've been trying to drive in our organisation without sounding too kind of, uh, I don't know, like, like I've drank the Kool-Aid, the learning Kool-Aid or <laughs> yeah. something like that, but learning is literally everywhere. And that's what we're trying to get across to people. Like every interaction you have, you can learn something from potentially. If you, if you think about it in the right way, you can take something away, a, a lesson or something not to do or something I, I should do, whether that's just how I introduce myself to someone and okay, great, I'm good at introductions now type of thing, or if it's something more complex than that. So it's just about, I feel certainly at Booking, we're trying to get that across to people that learning is not just this, this and this, yeah. it's, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So be, be open, be observant, because then you will learn. Yeah, and I think if I can add to that just a little bit is we are, f as we're lucky enough that we get to focus on, on organizational wide initiatives, and we're really trying to build up the employee's ability to self-reflect, right? Because that's where learning is really going to come from. You're on, on a phone call with a customer and something goes wrong. Well, when you hang up, you, gotta ref you have to reflect on what happened, what you would have done differently. And that is a, an amazing learning moment. But if you skip over that self-reflection, you're most likely not gonna learn from it. And you're, you may do it again and again. So we've, we've been really working on building up ways for people to build that self-reflection muscle and also provide each other feedback so that you're constantly getting feedback from your manager or your peers um, just to be able to kind of promote that learning is everywhere. Cool, yeah, thank I, you. I think that's really important in terms of we almost have a continuous job to do mm -hmm. to try and change the perception of what learning is. Um, and you know, to some extent, and you talked about kind of the different types of, you know, different parts of your organization that you have to treat very differently. And I think that's where we can learn a lot from what the marketeers do. Mm -hmm. You know, that we, we market learning in different ways to different parts of the organization, mm -hmm. but also to different types of learners as well. You know, we're starting to do some work around can you start to differentiate between different types of learners in the organization, between you know, learners that are not so strong, but learners that are and really uh, capable? And can you start to use those and market to mm -hmm. those in different ways? So um, I, I, we're certainly not there yet, but uh, we, we're, we're starting to look at how we can be more effective and deal with those problems. Yeah, and I would say just from what you're trying to solve, one of the things that we've done is because we have call center, um, we have bedside, we have all these people out, and don't and we get the same thing. I don't have time to learn. I don't have time to learn. And um, one of the things I would recommend is if you haven't yet, do an ethnographic study or workforce study. Go sit and watch them work if you haven't, and create personas, and then design for the hardest one. Because typically, if you design for the hardest one, um, and you're going to be able to hit many, many more. But having those personas and looking at human-centered design, multimodality, what they may find in, in the long run is your call center folks, um, you, may, you may mark them down to one minute in the break room. 
and it's optional learning at that point. And they might go, oh my God, did you see that video on so and You know, that was hilarious. And, and, um, and they, again, don't think about it of, oh my God, I have to go learn. Um, they're in just like they go out on Facebook. Yeah. Um, so just an idea. And the one thing I'd add to that is um, I work with a, a, a large global financial services organization. And one of the things they've done which really surprised me is have their CEO build a pathway and he shared it with the organization. And one of the things that's in that pathway is a suggestion to watch the, um, the Chernobyl drama, which was um, on Netflix recently. And I was like, well, OK. Uh, risk. It's all about risk avoidance. It's all about how to manage incidents and deal with it, which is key in financial services. And that is the single biggest piece of consumed and completed learning within that organization right now. So don't always think about learning in the context of exactly like these guys have all said. It's not all about formal learning. It's thinking about you know, learning and where it takes place in the moment and those kinds of things too. So thank you for the question. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, all good, good advice. So can I, can I follow up now? <laughs> I mean, you've got two, 24, 23, 20, 21, 20, no, I've 19. been on that side. I know that counter. <laughs> um, so then I'm just curious, related to this, sometimes I, we also, my organization also supports performance support. Yep. So kind of that inline knowledge performance support. I'm curious, is since I feel like it's an adjacent topic, has anyone, we haven't yet, but integrated or kind of tied in performance support into this, uh, especially from that frontline perspective. Do you guys want to answer that? Uh, we have, we, in, in my past life, we did. Um, and we used a couple different technologies. Um, and one that has worked really well and we implemented at a, another cellular company, <laughs> um, that's hot pink in nature, um, was walk me technology. And so um, for our call center folks, instead of taking them off of the, the floor, they could um, have walk me as an overlay and that was their training. So they were training on the job, plus it had online help right then. Um, so they had the ability to not get up from their seats and were able to day one um, be productive, and we didn't have to do any formalized training. Perfect. So, and that was in a new call center technology. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for those questions, and, and thanks to all of you guys for contributing. <laughs> um, I just want to say a really huge thanks to these guys for um, being up here on the stage with us today. Uh, we've really appreciated everything that you've brought to the conversation. So, thank you.